We're in the Gospel of Mark. We're in the Gospel of Mark. That's in the yellow pages. And uh, <clears throat> as we make our trip through the Gospel of Mark, we see Jesus as a servant. And that's why I would pick that verse that we have for our memory verse. And we looked last week at God's servant offering us forgiveness. The greatest need that mankind has is the forgiveness of their sins. And uh, he did, he, he, he showed that through the healing of the paralytic. And uh, that's what we looked at last week. This week, we, we're going to look at three things of the servant. Uh, forgiveness, today fulfillment, and then the next time that we will be looking at the third one of uh, freedom. So we have forgiveness, fulfillment, and freedom. Uh, the world's offering a multitude of things to find fulfillment in. But I'm going to tell you what, you follow the things of the world and you always come up empty. Uh, it was just like the wealthy man was asked, how much money is enough? And he said, just one more dollar. It's always just one more dollar, one more position, one more this, one more that. And, and there's no fulfillment there. He offers us uh, gladness instead of sadness. But the only place to find fulfillment, that is in Christ and following him. He doesn't take the old and make it better. He gives us something brand new. And, and that's what's exciting. God is in the business of confounding this world. He uses strange ways and strange people sometimes to promote his kingdom. And you'll see that as you see him in calling Levi, who is surnamed Matthew, the one who wrote the gospel. And uh, nobody would have thought, as we pick up here in verses 13 through 16 of chapter 2, it says, Then he went out again by the sea, and Jesus was a busy man. Busy man. And you see something that I keep on being reminded of. Jesus didn't just sit and wait for people to come to him. He went out. He was going out. And I'm going to tell you, once he, people got the message a little bit, remember, they're amazed. They're astonished. They've never seen anything like this guy. He heals the sick. He casts out demons. And he talks like he's God. Guess what? Yes, <laughs> but they can't believe it. they're astonished. They're amazed. And, and, and he went out. And the next thing you know, people are flocking on him. Remember, that's what happened with the paralytic. The, those four guys couldn't get that guy on his bed in there. So they had to go up on the roof, make a hole and drop him down in there. And Jesus forgave him. And he walked out of there a whole man, not just physically, but spiritually. And that's what counts. And so we see him going out again. And uh Verse 13 says, he went out again by the sea and all the multitude came to him and he taught them. Jesus was a, a wonderful teacher. He, he was great with object lessons. He could take something so simple and communicate deep spiritual truth through it. And later on, he'll do that through parables. And as we get into those and even when we we do the communion time and we will do the communion this time we skipped the last one because of the COVID thing but we'll do the next one here in November and uh, uh, he used two things what bread and wine to communicate wonderful spiritual truth something they have everyone had around there they knew what bread was and they knew what wine was and he took those things and he does that often to teach spiritual truth and he's teaching them and they're amazed at his teaching and and as he passed by he saw Levi the son of Alphaeus sitting at the tax office how many people here like the tax people <laughs> They're not our fondest group, <laughs> the IRS. <laughs> uh, well, they were even hated more by the Jews back here. Uh, the law of, and, and, and a tax office. And he said to him, follow me. Jesus is calling him to follow him. And that's what he's doing to us, right? He says, follow me. And I'll make you what? Fishers of men and women. That, that, that's a generic word there that could be both men and women 
God's not, um, uh, anyhow, God doesn't show favoritism. Let's just put it that way. So he arose and followed him. Now it happened as he was dining in Levi's house, Jesus, that many tax collectors and sinners also sat together with Jesus and the disciples, for there were many, and they followed him. And when the scribes and Pharisees saw him eating with the tax collectors and sinners, they said to his disciples, how is it that he eats and drinks with tax collectors and sinners? Levi, his name means joined, is like you joined a group. Uh, his name that he'll have given to him, Matthew, means a gift of God. He was a tax collector, or if you have the old King James, a publican. Taxes were collected from the Roman government by Jewish liaisons. And it wasn't so bad even that they collected taxes, is they collected more than they were supposed to. So they became rich. And they did well thriving on that. And so they were hated. They were a hated group. Uh, they were regarded as outcast. Uh, they could not serve as a witness or a judge. They were expelled from the synagogue. Uh, that, that's how, and they were considered to be traitors. And not only did it apply to them, it applied to their family. So folks looked at Levi's family as outcasts, as traitors. Uh, they were disgusted with them because they took sides with the Romans. And uh, which I think is so funny uh, about this because it won't be long and the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes, guess who they team up with to get rid of Jesus? The Herodians and with the Romans. <laughs> it, it, you know, it, it's amazing how that happens. But as at this point, so Jesus walks by and he sees that tax collector and he says, Hey, Levi, follow me. And what did Levi do? He followed him. Jesus was deliberately associating himself with the outcast of Jewish society. And that's what he's setting with sinners. Lord have mercy. <laughs> Why would he do that? Well, you know, he's, he's going to tell us here in just a little bit why he's doing that. But the, these scribes and Pharisees and all these legalistic people are, are just can't figure Jesus out. Because they think, remember, they think they're right. And they think he's wrong. Levi didn't argue or delay. He went right off and he left everything behind. Matter of fact, in Luke, we won't turn there, Luke 5, 28, it says, So he left all, rose up, and followed him. So he said, you know what? When I follow Jesus, I'm going to what? I'm going to follow Jesus wholeheartedly. I'm leaving all this behind. No longer. Because you know what? After he quits, he won't get his job back. <laughs> and uh, so uh, he, 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 that's the kind of guy he is. And, when, and Jesus calls us to, to work for him, to be his disciples, to be his family. He wants us to go in wholeheartedly. We talked about that a little bit in Sunday school about the heart. Jesus is interested in your heart. And he wants all of your heart. He wants all of you. And uh, it was, ex and, 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 and it's amazing how many people that Jesus calls into the ministry to his family that are the outcasts of society. A lot of bad people out there that he's called and God uses them in a way that's incredible. Uh, even the Apostle Paul, right? Paul was in charge of seeing people thrown in prison, stoned to death, and he could never get over that. He could hardly believe that God would use him and he used him amazingly, did he not? And Paul said that he was the chief of sinners. You know what? God loves the chief of sinners. He died for their sins on Calvary just the same way. Now, God hates sin. Don't get me wrong. But God loves that sinner. <laughs> That's why he died for the whole world, remember? And so he's going there and he's going to the sick. And that's what, and, but the critics are always there. Remember, whenever you're doing God's work, guess what? There's critics. There's going to be somebody on your case. And, uh, and if you're not a football fan, you won't get that. But 
I'm going to tell you of a guy that really had that problem. That was Tim Tebow. The guy didn't do anything but ever win, right? He won everywhere he went. He won a national college championship. He went down and got him into the playoffs. But they hated him. <laughs> and I believe it was only for one reason. And then he tried for football again this year and uh, didn't make it for the Jaguars because their coach, which used to be his coach while he was in Florida, uh, uh, is there. But uh, the critics are there. And, and when you stand up for the Lord, you might as well get ready. In today's society, you're going to be criticized. You tell people you're pro-life and they're going to say you're pro-dumb. <laughs> they don't like that. You tell them you're traditional marriage and they aren't going to like you. <laughs> and I can't help that. But that's what God says. You're right. No, we're just following the Lord. I tell them uh, I didn't make up the rules. This is what God said. I'm sorry. And uh, people break them. But I'm glad that even people that break God's rules can still get saved. And even after you're saved, sometimes we break God's rules and we still can find his grace and mercy there. That's the kind of Jesus we serve. Right. And, and I and, and that's what we see as we go through here. And and first Corinthians says that, you know, he didn't call many rich. He didn't call many brilliant. He, he takes the base things of the world. I said, oh, boy, is that great. <laughs> Because that's where I see myself. I, I, I see some of these guys that are so smart. They're, they know all the original languages. They can do all this and they got blah, blah, blah. And I'm thinking, man, I'm not that smart. But God didn't tell me that he called me because I was smart and beautiful and handsome. <laughs> or had hair. None of those things. He called me because he knew what was going on inside here and he wanted to use me. And so I just do what God asked me to do. Teach and preach his word and love a wonderful church family like this. And so Jesus didn't consider these people rejects. And if we go down here in verse 17, it says, When Jesus heard it, he said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician. I think most of us have more names of doctors in our black book than we maybe ever had. <laughs> uh, uh, it just seems like a, uh, I'm taking surely to doctor after doctor after doctor, <laughs> those kind of things. And uh, we went in for our MRI this week. And, you know, I'm really getting into the sound of those things. And uh, I sit there with her because she has claustrophobic, and even though they drugged her this time, pretty, pretty heavy. Matter of fact, the, the next day she looked like she was drunk she's having trouble walking and uh, those kind of things but so i get in there and they said you probably have some they give me earplugs this time they didn't last time but they gave me earplugs and that noise all those all those and it, i was marianne says she thought it sounded like a submarine i said oh boy i don't want to take a ride in that one <laughs> it's got some sounds in there but anyhow jesus says he's a physician and he says, I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And uh, the first example, he says, I want you to see me as a, the divine physician. Now, Jesus is God and he is Jehovah Rapha, the God who heals physically. And he heals physically. We're watching him. Remember, his real motive is always what? To hear you, heal you spiritually. He's more concerned with sinners getting converted than people that think they're righteous. He doesn't spend time arguing with the righteous. You know that? They come and ask him questions and he uses them as a way to jump into an avenue to teach them. And he says, you know why I'm sitting with these people? They need to be saved. They're sinners. And he said, when I go to the synagogue, I got a whole bunch of people that are self-righteous. And they don't need to get saved, even though they really do. They don't think they know, need to. And he says, so that's why I came. He said, I came to seek and to save those who were lost. Matthew's friends were patients who needed a physician. And Jesus says, he's the man. He said, he's the son of man. And he is, sin can be compared to sickness. And sin can be, or sickness can be healed just as Sin can be healed through his forgiveness, which we looked at last week. 
Now we see the see our Savior as a physician, and he comes to us in our need. I go to the doctor. I, I don't like going to the doctor. I'm going to tell you up front. I don't go unless I have to. I told the doctor last time. He said, well, I haven't seen you in a while. I said, well, I've been sick. I'm a kind of guy that if it's not broken, you don't have to fix it. And he said, well, you ought to come in for those wellness checks, whatever they call them. And I just got one. And I'm supposed to get one. That means they want money. And the hospital gets money for doing your blood work and all those things. You know, between the two, you, you know, you got to take out a small loan. And so I kind of like to keep my money myself. And uh, I can think of better things. So I don't give it to doctors anymore, and I have to. But I have to quite a bit because my wife demands that and her physical condition. But he comes to us in our need. And he comes and he has a perfect diagnosis. He knows exactly what's going on in your life. He knows if you're a sinner and you need to be saved. He knows if you're sinning and you need to repent. Remember, that's his message. Repent. That means to turn around. He knows it. He makes a perfect diagnosis. You can't tell him, well, you know, I'm not really that bad. Now, you know, not Bud. Now, he's, he, you know, he's bad. But I'm not that bad, Lord. And he says, yeah. Now, you see what's happening? You already just pointed too many fingers your way because you're already looking at somebody else instead of looking at me. And when you look at the Lord, you see that you're what? You're a sinner. And that's what happens. So he gets his focus and he provides a final and complete cure. When he saves the sinner, guess what? You're saved forever. Isn't that great? His blood paid for it all. And that's the kind of doctor he is. And you know what? He pays the bill. <laughs> he paid the bill. I don't have to, I don't worry about that coming in the mail. Three kinds of patients whom Jesus cannot heal of their sin sickness. Number one, those who do not know him. Romans 10 says that how can they hear if no one goes and tells them? Right? And that's what missionaries are designed to do. Go out and tell people that they need to hear the gospel. And that song's a great one. Anyhow, you'll get a new song next week and, and, and you can thank this guy. Well, maybe you won't thank him, but anyhow, you can thank Jim for that. It's got great words about sin and, and about going out and doing, taking care of that. And uh, it, it, it's a really good song. I don't know the song personally, but I read the words. Uh, so number one, those who do not know about him, but those who know about him, but refuse to trust him. Now, you, you may know a few of those. They heard, and they've heard, and they heard, but they haven't responded. And uh, I am going to tell you this. The more you hear and the less you respond, the harder your heart gets. But Jesus still can melt those hearts. And I, there's always hope with Jesus Christ. And I, I, I want, uh, you know, uh, uh, like I said, I, I prayed that my, my dad, I, I, he heard and he heard and he heard. And I was hoping the Lord would melt his heart. But I, he, he just kept on hardening his heart and rejecting the truth. That's what happens. And then you get the situation like the king and the plagues, the pharaoh there. But anyhow, so number three, those who will not admit that they need him. That, that, was, that was my dad. He, he, he didn't need anybody. This, that's what he thought. But you know, to get saved, you have to humble yourself before the Lord and realize, guess what? I need a Savior. Now, that's part of the work of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. He did that that day I got saved. I remember him working in my heart until I just was ready to fall down at his feet and say, I need a Savior. I knew it right then. And I asked Jesus to save me that day, January 22nd, 1985. Shirley and I right at the same table. That was the most fantastic thing. I praise God we both got saved the same night. Because I didn't have to go through that. Well, I've seen people go through that where one person's saved and one's not. And it's kind of a battle and struggle. And, and you know, because the Bible's clear, you know, light and darkness have a hard time getting along together. Just like gasoline and fire. And, and, and sometimes that's what happens. Sometimes it, it goes along fairly smoothly. Some people, 
are not quite as offended, but sooner or later it causes issues. But unless we admit that we're sinners deserving God's judgment, we cannot be saved. And, and I think that's what happens sometimes today. We don't get them lost. <laughs> we don't let them see that they're sinners because folks don't want to offend people today. They don't want to step on their toes. But my Bible's clear. We're all sinners. <laughs> I'm not telling you which sin's worse than others. God says we're all sinners. And because we're sinners, we're separated from God. And the only way we get saved is by asking him to forgive us of our what? Our sins. <laughs> and he does that. And that's his promise, because all promises of God come true. <laughs> and uh, he says, if you'll call on his name, you'll be saved. And that's what I did that day. I called on his name and he saved me. And I, I'm still amazed why he did that. But praise God, he did. I don't understand that, but he says that he did. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Luke 19.10. So he's going to get us another one here. So we can move along here and we'll... The disciples of John, in verses 18 through 20, Jesus is also the bridegroom. He's the divine physician, but he's also the bridegroom. And it says here, uh, the disciples of John and of Pharisees were fasting. Then they came and said to him, why did the disciples of John and of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? Anybody here ever fasted? Yeah, some, some of us. Some of us have, and, and I, I did it a couple of times with the youth group uh, when we, we used to have Word of Life, and, and uh, they, were, they were promoted a, a fast for the youth, and I, I always tried to do this. If the youth were doing it, I think the pastor ought to do that with them, right? Even though I had a youth pastor that was doing that with them, who's now with Word of Life. And, uh, uh, but he's the bridegroom. It says, and Jesus said to them, can the friends of the bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. He says, who goes to the wedding and fast? The bride's there, the bridegroom's there, and we're having a good time. I hope. <laughs> at least the last one I was at, they were all having a pretty good time. And a lot of them have a little dancing, a little drinking. I'm not into the drinking side of things, but... Uh, uh, they were having a good time and having joy. And that's what he's kind of, he says, I came to bring gladness. I came to bring joy. I didn't come to make everybody feel like they're, you know, uh, a worm. <laughs> you got to feel like you're a worm to get saved, but you don't have to live that way forever. And, and I think sometimes people, you know, I guess it's Chuck Swindoll or Dr. Jeremiah said people, I think it was Chuck Swindoll said it looked like people just ate a dill pickle. He said, you know, let's smile a little bit. Let's enjoy life. Uh, I, I'm saved. I'm going to heaven. Isn't that great? And, 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 and we can be happy about that. And he goes on to say, and, uh, But the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, and then they will fast in those days. So he says, you know, I, I come to bring gladness. I come to bring joy. My sins are forgiven. The bridegroom paid the price for the wedding and he married me to himself and then the scriptures and I have some references there for you and we won't take time for all of them but uh, he says I have come that you'll find fulfillment and being married to him in Romans 7 and uh, and a couple other places there he is the bridegroom and we're the bride and one day the bride's coming or the bridegroom's coming back Remember in the wedding, it was a little different. In the scriptural wedding, it was a little different than today. Now the bridegroom stands up here and we're all waiting for the bride to come. But in their time, the bridegroom was at, uh, the bride was at home and the bridegroom, they were waiting for him to come. And that's what we're waiting for now. And he's going to come in the clouds and he's going to shout. And uh, the horn's going to sign and we're, we're out of here. We're going to be with him forever. And we'll have the marriage feast of the Lamb. And uh, Jim's a good cook, but I think the Lord might outdo him. Because he, he always does. Remember what the wine? He turned water into wine. Guess where at? A wedding. <laughs> he went and did those things. And see, uh, some folks think to be a good Christian, you can't do any of that fun stuff. I think you can have fun, right? 
I can do great things. I can have fun. I can be out with people. Oh, they're not all saved. Yeah. <laughs> That's good. I mean, I wish everyone was saved, but you're out there with them. You see that you can have a good time, that you can fellowship with them. I have guys that I talk with and they're drinking a beer. I don't want to have a beer, but I still can talk to them. I still can be a witness to them. I st I'm not going to tell them, well, no, I'm Christian now. Don't you come near me. <laughs> right. That's, Jesus is out there with them. He's out there shaking hands with them. He's healing people. And he's having that. And so he's the bridegroom. And uh, remember that uh, when we get saved, we enter into that spiritual mar uh, marriage relationship. We bear his name. I am now a Christian. That means to be like Christ. We share in his wealth and power. All the glories of heaven are mine because they're Jesus's. Uh, we're co-heirs with Christ, it tells us in Romans. And that means 100%. We have all those things. We, we have power in his name and through the blood of Jesus and through the power of the Holy Spirit. We enjoy his love and protection. Isn't it something how God protects his family? I believe that. And I know things happen to his family and tragedies happen. But it's all under the umbrella of God's love and his loving hands. Nothing comes through into my life or your life without filter through the hands of the Lord. Because he loves you. And one day living in his glorious home in heaven. And, you know, he, he's building me a house. I'm kind of glad he's doing it. I'm kind of tired of building houses. <laughs> and he's building me one. And guess how long that house will last? It will never have to be remodeled. Will that be pretty cool? Yeah. I don't know if it just changes, you know, colors. If, you know, what, all those. Matthew 2.20 or Mark 2.20 here. But the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, and then they will fast in those days. Jesus has kind of given them a hint that, guess what? One day I'm leaving. One day he's going to die. He's going to be buried. He's going to rise again. And so he's kind of given them a little preliminary here. It won't be long. He's going to tell them three times in the book of Mark that he was going to be crucified. And he will be buried, and he will be raised again. But it went, did this. <laughs> right over their head. But we don't want that to happen here. He's going to be, uh, he says that it's going to happen. Uh, then he's going to give us one more example so we can finish up. He's going to tell us about wineskins. Now, I don't have any of those around, but uh, he says this. No one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. We have some seamstresses here to know that you don't sew a new patch on an old garment or else the new piece pulls away from the old and the tear is made worse. And so, like I said, I'm not a seamstress, so, uh, but I guess that's the way it is. And no one puts new wine in old wineskins. Now, I, I have helped in a little bit of process of making wine and it ferments and and it boils around a little bit and it expands because gases are getting off. And he says, so you, you can't take, he says, no one puts new wine in old wineskins because they're brittle. They're, they're already expanded as far as when you put it in there. He says, you're going to wreck, you're going to lose your wine. It's going to explode. Wine's gone. And your wineskin, what? Is no good anymore. So you, you lose out all the way around. He says, or else the new wine bursts the wineskins, the wine is spilled, and the wineskins are ruined, but new wine must be put into new wineskins. Jesus is trying to tell them that his way is a new way. He said it's not trying to correct or fix the old way. He said, I've come to give you a new way. Matter of fact, when we take the Lord's Supper, he says, this is done in the new covenant it's no longer the old covenant the new covenant fulfilled the old covenant but it's not dependent upon the old covenant for the new covenant it's something different Jesus says that you will be saved by grace through faith alone and that the Holy Spirit will come and live in you and enable you to do what they couldn't do you can live up to the law you can live up to the law. You are now righteous. 
2 Corinthians 5.21, For he who knew no sin became sin for you, that you might become the righteousness of God in him. In Christ you are righteous. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, you do not have to give in to sin any longer. Isn't that great? That, and he said, this is new. This is different. You can't put a patch on that any longer. People have been trying to patch up their lives for a long time. I know a lot of people that tried to quit drinking. They tried to quit doing drugs. They tried to quit doing things. They couldn't do it. Jesus came in and guess what? He made them new. You're a new creature. All things have become new. The old is passing. <laughs> the things are coming new. And that's, that's what he's trying to show them. I, I, I'm not coming here to make you a better Pharisee. I'm not coming here to make you a better Sadducee. I'm not here to make you a better scribe. He said, I'm not here to make you a, a born again believer, a Christian, part of the family. That's why. And, and, and there's only one way to get there, too. It's one way. Acts 4.12, nor is there salvation in any other. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Where do I find fulfillment? Becoming a child of God and walking in the ways of the Lord. And that's where it is. That's where true fulfillment is. The question comes, have you come to Jesus Christ as a sinner in need of a Savior? That's where it starts, right? He came to seek and to save that which was lost. And so his call is still going out. He's still calling people to salvation. Even as ugly as our world looks, people are still getting saved. Praise God for that. He's still calling men into ministry. He's still calling women into ministry. Not as preachers, but there's a lot of women in great ministries out there. Now, I, I separate there with those things, but there's a lot of good women. Uh, I have one of my favorites was Elizabeth Elliot. I'd love to hear that woman. She could teach just incredible. I'd just love to hear her. Kay Arthur's another one. Man, she's so smart. And she's Use, she writes study guides, and now her and her son write study guides together. And, and I'm thinking, uh, I'll bet he got that from it. He's a chip right off the old block. His mom was just a... a but boy, if you read about her past, oh boy. <laughs> She's one of those bad girls. <laughs> and she turned down the Christian thing for a while. It's just really, if you get a chance to read about her, uh, it, it's a great testimony. But uh, just to let you, just here as an example, uh, the, there's two ways to destroy a thing. You can smash it or you can permit it to fulfill itself. And that's what the law did and that's what Christians does. An acorn can be smashed with a hammer. Or it can be planted and allowed to grow into an oak. In both instances, the destruction of the acorn is accomplished, but the second instance, the acorn is destroyed by being what? Fulfilled. By becoming what God created you to be. That acorn can grow into a beautiful oak, and guess what? The acorn is no more. It's just like the kernel of corn, just like the kernel of wheat, right? It's a seed that's planted, and it doesn't even look like the seed. Who would think that an oak tree came out of a little acorn that big around. That's the most... I, I, I love to see things grow. I, I, I've never been a farmer farmer, but I love to see things. I can't wait to see the corn planted again next year. And the beans. And I see them sprouting out of the ground. I smell that dirt when you drive by that just got fresh worked up. And I know bud, this will get buds, taste buds going. Because uh, he's a farmer at heart. And there's something about smelling that dirt. I even like when I smell mowed grass. You know, I just, I just like that. I don't know what it is about those kind of things, but I, I like all those things. And, and Al likes to take those oak trees and cut them down and turn them into boards. And then they get turned into boards, was turned into houses or skids or whatever they happen to use them for. And, and, but uh, if he had to do that out of acorns, 
that you'd have to get a whole lot of acorns around to make any kind of lumber. And so uh, if you want to find fulfillment, you've got to go to the one that fulfill you. And that is the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's the one. He's the bridegroom. He's the great physician. Whatever you're needing for today, he is uh, offering us. And he's not patching up things, but he wants to make us new. And so... In